My name is Renee Maxwell. I'm a member of the John Brown Gun Club, and uh, this is a presentation that sort of explains our police and prison abolitionist stance, uh, and also explains our commitment to community defense and what that means to us and how we would love to see that uh, take root in our community here in Columbia. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We have some handouts up here for folks that didn't get one. Don't be shy. Come on up. Yeah. Uh, so these are just some of the topics we're going to cover and points you want to hit throughout the presentation. Uh, one thing I will ask is that if you have questions, to just kind of hold them until the end, and we're going to open up, open up the discussion to a Q&A. Um, and some of our other members will join me up here as well, uh, and we'll uh, have a conversation. So first I want to define uh, liberatory community defense. And a lot of time we sort of uh, shorten that to just community defense, but the liberatory aspect is a very important aspect to our values and our approach to community defense. And so there's a definition here that I cobbled together from uh, an anthology that was by Scott Crow called Setting Sites. Um, there's uh, more information about that in the handout. And so the definition we're going to work with here is, liberatory community defense is the collective practice of temporarily taking up arms for defensive purposes as part of larger engagements of self-determination in keeping with the liberatory ethics. So there, there's a lot going on in, in that. So what we're going to do over the next few slides is just sort of break that down piece by piece and delve into what that really means. Uh, but first, uh, we really want to emphasize the fact that community defense is not just guns. And we say that because we're the John Brown Gun Club, and a lot of people get really hung up on the whole gun thing. A lot of people pull us aside and tell us, hey, we really like all the stuff you guys are doing. It's really great, but we're not so sure about the gun stuff. Um, and yes, armed community defense is definitely a very important aspect of community defense, but it is not the only aspect. It is not greater than or lesser than any of the other aspects of community defense, but it is a critical component of it, and we'll get to that pretty soon here. So liberatory community defense must be part of larger engagements of self-determination, and what that means is uh, before you even approach community defense, like you really have to make a commitment to uh, building community and, and empowering people in your community uh, for self-determination. And that would look like things like mutual aid projects, harm reduction programs, co-ops, community gardens, farmers markets. Uh, we're looking for you know uh, grassroots efforts that are for and by members of the community, that are owned and operated by members of the community, and that where the resources stay within the community. Uh, so that's what that looks like. And liberatory community defense also must be in keeping with a liberatory ethics. And liberatory ethics is distinct from sort of a traditional ethical position because it is not defined by laws, first of all, but by ethics. And liberatory ethics challenge the political and economic power structures. And that's extremely important because a lot of ethical positions make a lot of assumptions based on um, the, the dominant systems, whereas a liberatory ethic should be compatible with the dismantlement of, of power, basically especially concentrated economic, social, and political power. So liberatory ethics is an alternative to mainstream moral philosophy, which takes for granted the dominant socioeconomic systems and values. And that's what we, we want to challenge with a liberatory ethic. And liberatory community defense is a temporary uh, taking up of arms for defensive purposes. So it is temporary, but also organized. 
and it only arises in response to very specific circumstances, usually some kind of direct or imminent threat of harm to somebody in the community or a group in the community. And it needs to be based on power sharing and egalitarian principles. And that has to happen long before any kind of conflict is engaged uh, because that already has to be foundational to your organization before you take up arms and decide to defend your community with force. Uh, and we want to contrast with uh, this sort of uh, defensive organization with things like militias as well as the military. Uh, militias are also defensive organizations. They tend to uh, be specific to more right-wing politics. Uh, they're also hierarchical. They're not accountable to their community and tend to feature a hypermasculine culture. And those are also that those are things are also true of the military industrial complex. So uh, clearly we are, we're going for something that, that presents an alternative to that type of community defense or even just defense, armed defense, I guess I should say. Uh, and liberatory community defense is a collective practice. And what that means is that community defense is not the same as self-defense. And we say this because uh, if you ever find yourself in right-wing gun culture, and God help you if you do, um, they're really big on the sheepdog mentality. Like, that, that's it's huge. It's weird. Um, and the, I don't know if all of you are familiar with that, but... The way they present it is they have this cute little story that they share. And I don't remember where it came from, some writer. Uh, so the way it works is you have, you know, the masses are the sheep, and they're dumb and clueless, and they have no idea how dangerous the world is. They just want to go about their ways and eat grass and mind their own business. And then you have the bad guys who are the wolves, and the wolves want to hurt the sheep. And the wolves are, you know, evil and terrible. And then you have the brave sheepdogs. And the brave sheepdogs put their bodies at, in, at risk to protect and save the poor helpless sheep who are too dumb to know that they're even in danger in the first place. And that's the mentality that you find in the, the self-defense right-wing gun culture. And it, it's really prevalent. Like, I just can't say that enough. Like, it's real. It's weird. Um, and we don't... That's not what community defense is about or should be about. Um, we, there are no others in community defense. We're all in this together, and there's no heroes, and there's no bad guys. There's no binaries like that. Um, the world is not that black and white, and we don't believe in othering or criminalizing people uh, just because they make bad decisions. Uh, I think everybody makes bad decisions sometimes, and we want to find a way to... Uh, address that in the community uh, with things like restorative justice, and we'll get to that too. All right, so that's liberatory community defense. So uh, we're going to talk about some real world examples. Um, we'll go through these real quick. The Black Panthers are a really well known uh, community defense group, they were very active in the 60s and 70s. Um, in different cities across the country. And not, I mean, they're famous for, you know, all their photos with the shotguns and at the Capitol and all the, their armed patrols. But they did a lot more than just armed patrols and intimidating white people with guns. They also had free medical centers. They had free breakfast programs for children. They had, um, they sponsored schools and just really cool stuff in their neighborhoods and in their communities. Uh, they were extremely invested in their communities and um, building up everyone in their community. So they had a very holistic view of community defense. Uh, the American Indian Movement is uh, another historic example of community defense. It was primarily an armed defensive movement because they were under direct threat and attack from the US government, uh, which did not recognize their treaties, and that's really what they were fighting for. Um, a good example of that was um, 
the siege at uh, their occupation of Wounded Knee and uh, they, their demands were for the U.S. government to honor its treaties. Um, and so that was quite the lengthy standoff. Uh, but it really brought their, it brought their community together in a lot of ways. And then Standing, Ra Standing Rock is a more current example of uh, Native people defending their territories and their treaties and their sacred lands. Uh, I think most folks here are probably familiar with that big movement. Uh, the Zapatista National Liberation Army, this, uh, they are based in Mexico. They are strongly anti-capitalist, indigenous revolutionaries. Uh, they're based in Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, they're anti-patriarchy, anti-capitalist, uh, and uh, again, another group that does a lot of community defense that is not just about armed defense and um, firearms. Uh, they, they really believe in uh, community autonomy uh, this sign here says, the people command and the government obeys, which I love. And they also recently announced that they have expanded their territories in Chiapas, which is just amazing. It's amazing. Of all the things happening in the world, like the Zapatistas are getting stronger and building their communities, and I just love that. Uh, and then we have in uh, northern Syria primarily, uh, the People's Defense Units and the Women's Defense Units, that's YPJ and YPG. Uh, they're primarily ethnic Kurds in northern Syria, and they've been fighting ISIS. I mean, we can't, the U.S. military has not even defeated ISIS, but this little group of anarchists are fighting the good fight up there and pretty much kicking ass, so that's awesome. So, now, back to Colombia. Why do we need alternatives to policing? Uh, and there's some pretty good explanations here. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole slide. It's in your handouts, so you can kind of get that. But, and I think given a lot of um, the recent media coverage and increased scrutiny of the police and policing across the country, uh, I think more there's more awareness to some degree of why policing is problematic and why, I mean, a lot of people, of course, at, are pushing for uh, reforms for the police. We would like to argue that you can't reform the police. We're better off without them entirely. Um, and these are just some of the reasons why uh, we can do better. And we think that we would like to see the police become obsolete because our communities have a, a strong engagement. So all these things are prime features of our punitive legal and justice system, and they stem from and are exacerbated by capitalism and the inequalities based on intersections of race and class. Um, and things like mass incarceration, the cash bail system, police violence, the war on drugs, mandatory minimum sentencing, for-profit prisons, the school-to-prison pipeline, like all of these things are these, this is violence that the system is committing on people in our community. Largely marginalized people are targeted by police and law enforcement. Um, mass incarceration is through the roof in this country. Our incarceration rate, incarceration rate in the U.S. is like just off the charts compared to other nations across the world. So, uh, and if, if, if it really worked, if all these things really deterred crime, then we would have fixed crime right now. Like, we would be in a crime-free society because we have all the incarceration, <laughs> we have all the police, we have an increasingly militarized police force, and supposedly those, those are things that, are, that we have implemented to deter things like crime and terrorism, and yet we still have plenty of crime, we have plenty of drugs, the war on drugs is not working, and I think like people are starting to catch on. But, and this is also something we hear an awful lot when we talk about community defense, and in particular armed defense, is, but doesn't violence beget violence? And there are people who are really invested in the ethics of nonviolence um, and those principles, and 
that's perfectly understandable and that's perfectly respectful. There's um, nothing wrong with that um, at an individual level. But we really want people to examine their position on nonviolence because the majority of those people, one, are white middle class people who don't live with the same level of threats and insecurity and marginalization that a lot of other people do in other communities. Uh, your safety is a privilege. Also, when you make a commitment to nonviolence, but then you rely on the police for your safety and protection, you're basically outsourcing violence to the state. And as long as the state has a monopoly on violence, then we're all complicit in that violence. So unless you're unwilling to call the police, unless you're organizing marches and rallies without police protection, you're not truly nonviolent. You're basically just outsourcing it and legitimizing the violence of the state. And that is inherent in our entire in economic system. It's inherent in capitalism. It's inherent in white supremacy, which is the root of all of these things. So we're all complicit. Like, there's just really no getting around that. That's the world we live in. And so let's talk about, like, what are the problems that police solve or that, that we expect police to solve every day in our community? Like, why do we have police? Well, I think it's clear that police don't actually prevent or deter crime. They largely just respond to it. Again, I think that if police were actually preventing crime, we have an awful lot of them. And if punitive justice were a deterrent to crime, then it would be gone already because there's a lot of people in jail right now. Uh, Police do enforce traffic laws. However, I think you could argue that you don't need a gun to do that. You can write tickets and pull people over for um, unsafe driving <clears throat> without threatening to shoot them. Uh, police will make an arrest after a crime is committed, and they transport those people to jail. So they do, once, once they know about a crime, uh, they catch the bad guy, and they put him in prison. Well, I shouldn't say bad guy. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but they will arrest the perpetrator and put them in, in jail. And then that's when the penal system abuses people as punishment in prison. And the prisons of the incarceration system are also fairly well documented. Our prison conditions are pretty abhorrent, honestly. And I, I'd also like to mention that we already have kids in cages everywhere here in Boone County. And people are mostly okay with that. They just accept that because they're nice cages, you know? They got food, water, all that good stuff. So it's, be it's, it's become pretty normalized to imprison children and arrest children for like schoolyard fights nowadays. And that's why we want to get cops out of schools. All right, so how can we solve these problems ourselves? And we think, we propose, that we must first address the root causes of violence and crime in our communities. Um, and that requires us to look at things like economic inequality, systemic racism, lack of access to health care and resources, and then also isolation and lack of community connections. And those are also conditions that are inherent to capitalism, where people are expected to fend for themselves and pull themselves up by their bootstraps, um, and they're pretty much on their own when they're struggling to make ends meet. And we're all just basically fighting over the same crumbs while the ruling class gets richer and richer. So those are the kind of things that we want to dismantle and um, in any little way we can in our own communities. And we believe that building strong communities and community relationships is the best way to make neighborhoods safer and healthier places for everyone. All right, so what does that even look like? Like, so where can we begin right here in our community? And we wanted to share this excerpt from the Missouri Faith Voices Moral Agenda. They published this earlier this year, I think it was in the winter. And we were really excited to see this. It's actually a pretty radical document. I really encourage folks to read the whole thing. But this is just one piece that I'll, I'll read now. And it says, 
We envision a community where every person is safe and free, where policing is dismantled because neighbors are supported in addressing the root causes of violence and crime, and where punitive measures are replaced by restorative justice processes that take both harm and humanity seriously. And I love that. And you know, these are like church people. This is not like some radical leftist concept right now. Uh, this is pretty mainstream, and this is what we want to see. We want to see this become more mainstream. The idea that you know communities are safer without the police, um, we want to see that normalized. So that's why we're here. Um, and so here's some examples of things that are already happening here in Columbia and uh, the kind of work that is required to you know build our communities. Uh, Race Matters Friends has a community bailout fund. And that's a, a great way to disrupt the cash bail system. It's an awesome fund. I encourage folks to donate to that if you can. They always need money. Um, and that's how you get poor people out of jail. That's really what cash bail does. It basically means that if you can't afford to bail yourself out of jail, then you have to sit in jail until your court date, which you know can be days or weeks or more. And you know, rich people or you know people with means have no problem paying that, and they can go back to work the next day and get on with their lives. But if you don't have that money, you could lose your job, you could lose uh, your housing, you could, and that you know is a domino effect. You can lose your health insurance, you can lose custody of your children. Like it, it's a it's a domino effect, and um, it has it's a big impact for people who just can't afford those fees and those fees do pile up and that's a lot of times how people end up in jail like a simple traffic ticket can become like a huge barrier for folks uh, and then harm reduction programs I'm not sure if anyone's doing that explicitly here but I know there's um, some low-level efforts to like distribute Narcan and stuff like that we'd love to see more people doing stuff like that um, the opioid crisis I think has uh, shown that there's a real need for that everywhere. There will be Narcan in all of the residential halls on the zoo's campus. Really? That's great. Thank you. That's good to know. Um, and then, of course, you know, we want to, we want to see things like improving access to health care, um, which should include mental health services and addiction treatment programs, uh, housing justice programs. And there's definitely a lot of work around housing justice happening in Columbia right now. Um, it's a lot of work to address homelessness and um, housing insecurity, but there are definitely folks who are committed to doing that, and we want to see more pressure on our um, city council and other folks to take that seriously and make it a priority. That's what this is really, all this is really about priorities. Like, we have the resources already, right now. We have all the resources we need to make all of these things possible. It's just a matter of priorities and that's what that's where you know public pressure really comes in um, restorative justice programs uh, particularly in schools I think uh, are an easy place maybe not easy but an obvious place to implement restorative justice before kids end up in um, the juvenile justice system because uh, once a, once a kid gets into that system it's really hard to get out like it, it really reduces a lot of their opportunities going forward and restorative justice in schools should be a no-brainer really like we shouldn't be arresting kids at school and putting them in detention centers that's ridiculous uh, and Columbia could do a much better job of that speak to that firsthand um, we also like to promote firearms training for marginalized people firearms training is not easy to come by it can be expensive um, it's also primarily available in those toxic right-wing spaces where a lot of people don't feel safe or comfortable. Um, and so that's one thing the John Brown Gun Club does is we offer firearms training for people who either can't afford it or don't want to seek it in those spaces. Uh, things like neighborhood patrols focused on curbing violence. Uh, there's a program in St. Louis called Cure Violence. It also happened in, I think it was Milwaukee. Um, as a response to gun violence in their communities. And what I like about uh, the Cure Violence program is that it actually hires and trains people from those communities to do this work within their own neighborhoods. So it keeps the money in that community and it empowers people in that community who already have relationships with people who are participating in gun violence or that sort of thing. Um, so they can build on those relationships to make a difference. 
Um, and one thing that would really make a big difference is decriminal decriminalization of almost every crime. Like, really. Uh, that's one way to keep people out of prison. Um, and that's where you can also combine that with things like restorative justice. And then direct democracy at the community level. So these are all things that are definitely possible to implement at the local and community level. So uh, law enforcement combined with the punitive justice system destabilizes communities. Community policing does not decrease law enforcement use of force, it increases it. It increases their presence in targeted neighborhoods. Um, and we do not advocate for police reform or community policing for that reason. It tends to be just a back door for more resources for the police and more, more police on the streets. And that's really not what we want. And a great example of how that worked out is in New York City. Uh, a lot of people in New York City started getting mad about the stop and frisk program there and complaining about how it's racist and terrible and um, maybe unconstitutional. And so the police got kind of mad about that because they were getting under fire. And so they threw a little hissy fit and said, well, fine, we're not going to patrol your neighborhoods anymore. See how you like that? And it was great. <laughs> it was so much better. Um, and. Uh, and that, yeah, crime actually went down when the cops left people alone. Like, it was wonderful. So, go New York City. All right, um, and then, so here's some examples of some mutual aid projects and community defense related work that uh, the John Brown Gun Club does here in Columbia. One of those is Op Safe Winter, or Operation Safe Winter, which we're actually getting ready to kick off really soon here, we're going to have a, a front porch donation drive. Uh, UpSafe Winter, what UpSafe Winter is all about, it's a seasonal homeless outreach program that uh, distributes goods to homeless people, like where they're at, meets them where they're at. It's a street distribution program. So, and we like to host community meals and free distribution days where folks can come and hang out and eat with us and take anything they need. And we have things like, you know, warm winter clothes and supplies and sleeping bags, as well as toilet, toiletries and other items that people need. Uh, and yet, last year was the first year we did that. It was wildly successful. We got a lot of support from the community, which was really exciting and encouraging. Like, people really wanted to contribute to that. So we're excited to do it again this year. We really want to build on that success. and. Um, try to increase our reach and maybe uh, do things a little more efficiently, but uh, that's a really cool project that is about to happen now. And similarly, the, our mobile soup kitchen uh, also happens over the, over the winter, and that's where our members, as well as some of our supporters, we have a group called the Friends of John Brown, and that's for people who want to support our community work but who aren't necessarily able or ready to commit to like full-blown membership. Um, so the Friends of John Brown is sort of like our little auxiliary club. And a lot of those folks support stuff like Up Safe Winter and the Mobile Soup Kitchen, which actually delivers food directly to people in homeless camps and takes the food to them in the winter months when the weather is pretty harsh and people are living outdoors. All right, and then some not local examples of community defense. This came up after uh, the awful mosque shootings in New Zealand, in Christchurch, New Zealand. After that happened, this uh, biker club called the Mongrel Mob, and then some other similar gangs, biker gangs, uh, provided security for these mosques and offered to basically like stand guard while they were in fellowship there so that uh, they would feel safe and they could worship without feeling vulnerable. So this is what we want. We want to imagine a community without police and what that would look like. And some components of a community where police are obsolete, you would have engaged neighborhoods, engaged citizens, uh, strong community connections that eliminate the need for police and punitive justice, um, support networks that protect and defend vulnerable communities, 
And we want to nurture empathy, generosity, and courage, because those are the qualities that really have the highest value when it comes to uh, any sort of successful efforts in a community where people want to work together to improve the quality of life for everyone. So those are the things we want to nurture. And that's it. Strong communities make the police obsolete. And that's what we're going for here. Um, and it seems like a lot of work. And it might seem out of reach. But we really we really believe that it is, it, it is possible. And yes, it is a process. Um, it's not something you can just do overnight. But it definitely is something that is attainable with the right amount of commitment from people in the community. Uh, and so that's what we're, we want to just kind of normalize the concept and get people thinking about uh, the possibilities because the more people start thinking about it, um, the more accessible it, it seems and the more we have of us who are, you know, willing to make those kind of changes on the ground. So that's all I have. We're going to open up for Q&A. I'm going to ask some of my comrades to join me up here.